I will welcome. I'm glad to see everyone here for this next edition of the AFOSR uh, 60th Anniversary Speaker Series. Um, for those of you who uh, who wondered why I look so bad, I'm not Blan Van Blackwood. I'm, I'm Tom Huzzy, Chief Scientist of AFOSR. And, um, <laughs> And uh, today we'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Rajesh Naik, who hails from uh, uh, AFRL, <coughs> AFRL Materials and Manufacturing Directorate, where he currently conducts his research at the Nonmetallic Material Division's Nanostructured and Biological Materials Branch at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. Recently, Dr. Naik was honored with the Outstanding Air Force Scientist Award in the Mid-Career Civilian category, for his significant scientific achievements in the area of biologically inspired and derived materials. He was also recognized for performing the first ever investigation aimed at developing a low temperature chemical conversion process, and he won a patent for this work, paving the way for revolutionary new methods for disrupted technologies of material synthesis and device fabrication for the Air Force. He has a wide, uh, a, a wide range of interests and achievements. He was, he's been cited for the discovery of novel biologically derived me metal nanoparticles that can be produced in a clean, cost-effective way without harming the environment. He's an internationally recognized expert in creating biomimetic approaches for material synthesis. And his research interests also include biomineralization, protein self-assembly, nanostructured materials, and protein engineering. Today, Dr. Nag will present hierarchically assembled materials using biological building blocks and their application. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Rajesh Nag. Thanks, Rajesh. Thanks for coming. Thanks, Tom, and thanks to all of you for coming. Uh, it's an honor to be here, and I can proudly say that uh, what you're going to hear today would not have been possible without investment from OSR back about, I would say, 12 years ago, where we, our first grant was from OSR to fund research in looking at biomedic materials uh, when uh, Bob Cohen was, was around. An easier program manager than Hugh DeLong when Hugh DeLong took over. <laughs> um, but Hugh DeLong is my current uh, program manager, but I've also got funding from other PMs, and I'm grateful for that. And you're going to see some of the things that we have been able to achieve from a 6-1 standpoint, but also using some of the discoveries from a 6-1 program to transition that into 6-2 activities at AFRL, but not only in my directorate, but also at the AFRL level through the STT program. So we have two programs right now that's funded at the AFRL level that's come out of work that's been funded through 6-1. And this is also an area of investment in my directorate. Our director has put bio as an area of priority for her. Uh, so she is going to put 6-2 core dolls into the program or whatever code dolls we have will not be cut, so which is a good thing. Uh, just to tell you a little bit that we, I was at the Nanostructure Biological Materials. I am still there as of till September of this, this year. Then we change. We don't become, we're no more Nanostructure and Biological Materials branch. We become soft matter branch uh, because we've gone down, the materials directory has gone down from three research divisions to two research divisions. Uh, so there's been some reorganization in, in our directorate, and they've merged a couple uh, of uh, directorates together. So we and RXP, if you guys know where they do the laser hardening, has become one now. Uh, and then the metal guys are separate. So enough of that, and what, let's get into the technical meat. I'm going to talk, be talking about some of the work that's been going on in, in the materials directorate, but also in collaboration with the human effectiveness director because we find them as a trans transition partner with some of our technologies that we develop uh, through, uh, through the activities at, at, uh, at RX. Um, before I forget, uh, let me first acknowledge the people who do the work. I've, had a, I've been fortunate to have a good crew of people uh, in the lab uh, through uh, the on-site uh, contractor that we've been able to bring in, as well as through the NRC postdoctoral fellowship. But also a lot of undergrads who come in and spend uh, either uh, the summers or spend the year around uh, in the afternoons coming back and uh, coming and working on research groups uh, research uh, activities uh, in the lab. And also a whole list of collaborators uh, that we worked with uh, at Air, Air 4L, but also through the Air Force R program. We have a lot of interactions with the PIs. We're actively engaged. We have exchanges between the faculty members and students between uh, my labs and, and theirs. 
and also the funding agencies. Uh, before I used to have the size of the circle denominates denotes how much money I get from each person or each agency. Uh, uh, we do get a lot from AFRA, from, from, in, in sense a lot means uh, a large portion of our funds comes through AFRA uh, for our, 60, our STT programs, 6-1 from Air Force R, and we have some internal funding from, uh, from RX as well. I'll sh talk to you about some of the work we've done that we've leveraged through uh, uh, DITRA on some decon uh, materials that we've developed, uh, if I have time to, and finally DARPA as well that funded a bee program, a sensing program that looked at bees, but we were looking at the molecular mechanism of that, which uh, he was a big fan of, as I heard. Um, a little bit on, on why, why look at biological materials and, and our interest. Uh, over the years, if you look at you know, various documents as well as the Tech Horizon reports, uh, a lot of things come out uh, in terms of what new technologies you have to develop in order to achieve uh, some of the SNT um, challenges uh, that have been listed in, in the Tech Horizon uh, 2010. And things like new materials grown to order, look at new energy sources and storage, sensor materials, adaptive morphing system, and enhancing cognitive abilities to address some of the things that I've listed here. Within our branch and my group, we're interested in looking at bio-nanomaterials, bio looking at the structure, property, performance, processing relationships, and also using things like knowledge digitization, just not to do fundamental research, but also getting the, those uh, uh, results are, are, are addressing some of the needs uh, that would address our stage two roadmap activities that we have internal to our directorate. So an, a nice pipeline of taking our 6-1 activities into 6-2 um, uh, work uh, within AFRL, RX and as well as AFRL. Some of the things, this is my list of, I, I put, put down my list of opportunities I see for biology and biological materials for aerospace applications. Uh, and, and this is aerospace, but also DOD in general, uh, all the way from energy harvesting and generation uh, applications. Look at dielectric materials. We've done some work on using silk as well as DNA as dielectric materials. And we see very interesting properties that have arisen, arisen from, from, from that, those materials uh, for dielectric uh, applications. Uh, work at Tyndall Air Force Base, look at uh, biofuel cells, enzymatic and microbial fuel cells, which is, which is also of interest. And then in the area of uh, artificial photosynthesis, how can you create a leaf mimic? Uh, and the list goes on. Uh, some of my interest has been in this area, particularly looking at sensors for situational awareness, developing what we call, mean by close-in ISR sensors, so you can distribute this in an environment and get situational awareness uh, using both biological and non-biological approaches. An area that we've been pushing uh, within AFRL is trying to use biology and other approaches to create devices that don't require clean rooms uh, to assemble devices. So we look at alternatives, cheaper ways of making low-cost devices, things on paper, for example, using paper fluidics, pioneered by George Whitesides. But how can you incorporate that to address uh, uh, Air Force needs? And then looking at things like bottom-up assembly of structures for bio nanoelectronics as well. And, and as my, 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 my title says, it mentions hierarchical assembly of biological building blocks. And what I put here is that biological building blocks, you can get them in, in a variety of scales, all the way from a few nanometers in terms of peptides or lower in case of amino acids, all the way to centimeters and larger when it comes to biosystems. And each of these are each of the, this materials are hierarchically assembled to give you a, a very complex system that can, can carry on multiple functions. But each of this moieties or each of these this, this molecules have unique properties that one can exploit. And I'll show you along the way how we have taken things like peptides, proteins, uh, to address things uh, of interest to us in terms of designing materials, uh, developing new sensor capabilities. Uh, I will not get into the optics realm. We've done quite a bit understanding butterfly and, and uh, feathers from, from birds and what are the what are the unique nanoscale features that are based on a proteinaceous material that gives that iridescent properties. Uh, uh, we'll not get into that today because of time. And some work we've done on catalysis where we've looked at peptides to make catalytic particles and we see enhanced efficiencies uh, when we use a peptide-based approach on making some of these materials, uh, which I will also not be talking about today. Uh, I'm going to talk of three things. I'm going to break it into three things as, as time permits me to do. One is trying to, to discuss some of the things that we'll be doing in the bio-nano interface to create multifunctional materials. Uh, the second one is looking at self-assembled biological structures, uh, things like protein cages uh, that we have used uh, in the lab to create uh, energetic materials or enhance energetics of, 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 uh, of nano-aluminum. And the last one is going to be in, in the area of biomedical materials, looking at silk 
as a matrix to encapsulate enzymes that can be used for uh, infilled uh, enzymatic assays. Uh, uh, this is uh, a work that I can break into three different boxes. Uh, these are the guys who do the work. I only get to uh, give the talk. And I would also like to acknowledge uh, collaborators, uh, both experimentalists as well as modelers, who have helped in understanding how peptides interact with inorganic surfaces or, or abiotic surfaces and how that can be used in the functionalization of the structures to create sensors and other devices. And some of the things that we've been seeing in what we call emergent properties when we assemble biological peptides or biological, uh, biological molecules on the surface of nanoscale uh, materials. We're beginning to see some very unusual properties arise and functions that have not been discovered before. And this was just by, by happenstance that we've been able to see some of these unique properties we, where we see chiral inversion in peptides, which take the half-life or some of those things to happen in, in, in nature uh, thousands of years, and we can get them to happen on the surface of nanoparticle uh, relatively easy. So the take home message from this part of my talk would be that peptides, peptide interfaces, uh, and peptides I mean by you know, short stretches of amino acids, anywhere between uh, five to about 20 amino acids uh, that, that are, are in a peptide uh, uh, chain that interacts with an inorganic surface, can be used in assembling hybrid structures, how we can use some of these peptides to uh, create new recognition elements that can be used for sensing uh, applications, and some of the emergent properties I mentioned that we see in some of these bio-nano assemblies. And the idea is, can you control some of these nano, nano material properties using uh, these biomarkers that we've identified uh, through this approach? Uh, in the abiotic-biotic interactions, we are trying to exploit the diversity of amino acids on how they interact with crystal phases and how they can sort of control the growth and nucleation of nanoparticles to give very unique architectures or hybrid structures and, and what are the properties that arise uh, from, from those, uh, those hybrid structures that we create. At a fundamental level, we're interested in how those amino acids interact with the surface, so looking at things like uh, interaction energies and, 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 and the amino acid composition that drive the interaction of uh, the peptide with a given surface is also of interest uh, to us. So, so why biomolecules or biomolecular templates? This is some of the unique characteristics of, of biological molecules. I'm not going to go into the details, but the idea is to take some of these unique properties of biological molecules and associate that with the physical properties of abiotic materials, whether it's optical, catalytic, or electronic properties. And I'll show you some of the work we've been using, doing in terms of interfacing peptides with carbon nanotubes and graphene to create field effect transistors for sensing. Uh, the motivation is most of these things, you can use ambient uh, reaction conditions to assemble them. You can, you can get bottom-up assembly. And by having a acid on the backbone, you have multifunctionality. You can attach other things and create much more complex structures. And you can also tune it by changing the amino acid sequence. And, and those are things that we, uh, we do uh, within, within the group. But the challenges associated with this. Uh, it is just not taking a peptide and you throw it and it binds with the surface and it's all set to go. Uh, that is why, you know, the law, that's why, you know, we, within our 6-1 activity, we're addressing some of these challenges is what dictates that interaction uh, with, of a biomarker with the surface. Uh, can you look at non-biogenic materials apart from bone that, you know, the, the, the biomedical community looks at or, or silica or calcium carbonate, which is pretty well known. Can you look at technologically relevant materials that of, that's of interest to us from an engineering standpoint? And can you use biomacromolecules to recognize those surfaces? And can you engineer new functionalities into those surfaces and create uh, nanoarchitectures that have now some of these displayed functionalities that the biological molecule can, can bring, bring to you? So there's been a lot of work in the area of sort of nano, nano naturally occurring peptides and proteins, or what we call uh, peptides or proteins that interact with biogenic materials. So things like silica cell wall or the calcium carbonate in, in nacre. Uh, the pro, this is tour de force kind of activities that have been done by uh, the academics to identify proteins and, and peptides that are associated uh, with some of these uh, inorganic structures. Uh, work from Dan Morris, Niels Kroger, Christine Ortiz, so on and so forth, have identified proteins and peptides that interact with these biogenic materials. Now, this is a, a, a time of all process and maybe several PhD students' thesis that is involved in identifying these proteins and, and getting them out. Things are getting faster now, but it's also still time consuming. We take the lazy man's approach. Uh, we, we do what we call of evolution in a test tube. So we try to take a comitola library of different peptides, throw it into a test tube, and look for things that like to bind to a surface. So it's like finding a, a needle in a haystack uh, using a biological approach, but then you can easily recover that sequence 
or that peptide that likes to bind to an or inorganic surface, and then you can identify what, what is the amino acid characteristics that are involved in that interaction. What this peptide has, as I mentioned earlier, is a diversity. This, this is 20, the 20 amino acids in single letter code that have been broken down into hydrophobic, polar, charged, aromatic residues. And you can see, because of this chemical functionalities or diversity within those peptides, more likely you will find something that binds to a given target. And that interaction is specific. It is just not a random uh, 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 jumble of sequences that you get out that binds to a surface. It is, there is a specific way these peptides are displayed and the specific context on how these amino acids are displayed that drive that interaction. I'll show you experiments that we have done in the lab to show that, that if you scramble the sequence or you mutate it, the interaction goes away. It goes back to biology. All, all recognition in your body is very sequence specific. Mutations can be detrimental or can, can reduce interactions with, with a given target. The same is the case here with an inorganic uh, uh, target as well. So the idea is exploiting the chemical diversity of amino acids to identify selective uh, binders. Uh, the example I'm going to give you today is some of the work we've been doing on carbon nan nanomaterials, na nanomaterial binders. One of the things we were interested in seeing the effect of, of curvature. If I had a carbon nanotube versus a planar carbon sheet, if I seek screened for peptides that bind to this, uh, this materials, are there differences in those peptide populations? Are there specific chemical functionalities that I can decipher from that population of peptides that can allow me to design things rationally to functionalize the surface of those inorganic, uh, of these organic structures? And with graphene, not only do you have, it's just not a planar sheet, but also you have edges and plane, which give you a maybe additional uh, parameter that you can screen for, for looking for things that bind to the edge versus the plane. And can you identify peptides that have that kind of selectivity in them? Uh, the reason for this is, you know, surface chemistry and the interface chemistry on, on these carbon nanomaterials does influence, you know, electronic band gap structure, functionality, dispersion, so on and so forth. Uh, the driver has always been to trying to identify non covalent interactions, so you don't want to introduce defects into some of these materials. Uh, so if you can use a peptide-based route to sort of non-covalently interact, can you sort of preserve some of the intrinsic properties and use that to build devices or other, um, uh, other uh, materials that is of interest uh, uh, to us? So I'm not going to go into the details of graphene. I'm sure everyone it is, it's, is the molecule or, or, or the material of the year, I would say, or a month. Uh, uh, currently, everyone does graphene work, but our motivation was from a fundamental standpoint is to understand if I found a graphene binder, can I sort of differentiate between an edge and a plane, and can I differentiate those that like to bind to graphene to a carbon nanotube, and what is it that drives that differentiation? And because this is a nice flat uh, plane system, you can also look at, you know, can you also characterize how these peptides interact with the material doing force distance measurements so you can see interaction energies uh, using AFM-based techniques. And the, and the idea is you, maybe you can use this to sort of non covalently functionalize graphene. Um, we have done a lot of the, the, the characterization you know, using FTR-based methods, CD spectroscopy, looking at protein structures, uh, doing Raman spectroscopy to making, to making sure that we're not introducing any defects. So we see that we, we introduce very little or no defects you know, when you non covalently interact with, with the peptide. We know the peptide, when it binds to the graphene structure, tends to sort of assume some kind of a secondary structure. So it's random in solution, but then when it sees the surface, it actually forms some kind of a very, very unique stru secondary structure, and that gives rise to tertiary structures that you will see uh, that are formed on the surface of, of the graphene uh, sheet. So here's one example that we identified. This, is, this was published uh, uh, that shows that we have a peptide sequence that likes to bind to an edge and one that likes to bind uh, to the plane. Okay. Now this is HOPG, this is uh, highly ordered pyrolytic graphite, that's what we use, so we freshly cleave off and we use that because we want large areas and you can do AFM and things of that nature. And you can see this peptide, for example, likes to, these are the edges of that HOPG sheet. And you can see the peptide actually assembles and aggregates at that edge, okay? It does not coat the whole surface. Whereas this, pro, this peptide coats the whole surface, it forms a monolayer, but because there's water that's lost during the evaporation, it leaves this sort of herringbone structure behind. Okay? That is just an artifact of the drying process. We have monitored it using AFM. You can actually see them evolve. So they are just the holes that, are, that, are, that have been left behind. And it's nice because you can go do AFM and you can actually get a monolayer thickness uh, from, from, from that. We know that this is, for example, this peptide is, is very pH sensitive. So if I flip the pH, if I go to acidic pH, I can knock off those peptides from the surface and they actually go onto the plane. So they go from this edge 
onto the plane. This white area that you see is actually the peptide has come off and actually gone there. So you can actually use pH as a way to control because a specific amino acid by computational tools that we've developed, uh, com computational methods we developed in the lab has shown that a specific amino acid interactions with the edge. The edge is proton terminated. So you think that you would need some uh, negatively charged groups to bind onto that, onto that edge. So if you knock off that group, you disrupt uh, the binding activity. Uh, and this is just showing you that map of the proton terminated edges on a graphene sheet. What is interesting is that if I took that sequence, uh, this is one example, this is amino acid, uh, in, in single amino acid code, this is a seven amino acid peptide. And I started to do it, play, play with it a little bit. If I knock this one out, if I, this glutamic acid, if I pull it out and I put a glycine in place, which is a small amino acid, remove that charge residue away, you can see now the morphology of that binding event on, on the graphene surface is completely different. Okay. So that tells you that amino acid is required for that edge binding. But now if I say, okay, is it just one amino acid? Now what if I took that whole sequence and I jumbled it? What happens? So I take that same sequence, I just jumbled it, and create a synthetic peptide, now you can see the morphology is completely different. It coats the whole surface and forms this sort of reticular network as seen by AFM. Okay, so this tells you two things. One, that amino acid composition is critical, but also the context on how that amino acid is displayed is also critical. So just putting amino acids together, oh, I have, it's a, I, I, you know, aromatic residue should work well, I'm binding to a graphene surface, a carbon nanotube surface, I'll just throw that and they'll bind, it's not the case, okay? Because this has evolved through uh, the, the evolution in a test tube method and you get very highly specific sequence that have an affinity for your, for your surface. This is done in the drug industry. Uh, normally and other genetic tools have been used that use computational approaches to identify highly specific sequences. So the take home message from this is that amino acid con uh, composition and context uh, is critical uh, for the binding onto a graphene surface. And you can build upon this. If I would really want to create a hybrid material, I can think of you know, putting things together where I have one likes to bind to graphene, maybe something else likes to bind to gold or some other material of interest. I can mix it onto the surface. And here is now gold nanoparticles actually assembling on the edges of graphene sheet. I don't know whether you can see the red lines, but we have mapped the edges uh, using AFM and we can show where the gold nanoparticles uh, go. And this is just a quantitative estimation that you can see a large portion of them do go to the edge of the graphene sheet. So now you can couple maybe the electronic properties with graphene, of graphene with maybe the optical or plasmonic properties of, of gold. So it allows you to create uh, an interesting uh, material uh, architectures that way by using this peptide-based approach. And we've used this for various other things uh, in, in the group, uh, but don't have uh, time to go in. So I've, I've, had, I've done all this, okay, so what's, what's the big deal? What, what am I gonna use it for? So I'm gonna give you some examples on how we've used this to solve uh, some problems that's of interest to us. And the first one was, was a program that we were involved with, with DARPA. So DARPA had this program where they were training bees to sense explosives. I don't know whether you remember this. This is back in the early uh, 2000s, I think 2006 or something, where they were trying to exploit some of the receptors that are present in bees. It could be in the antenna, on the legs, or on the wings, that specifically bind to explosive agents. And they were training the bees. Uh, so they had you know, a hive, they had a beekeeper. He would train them uh, through a Pavlovian kind of an approach to train bees to sense TNT. So every time it will sense TNT, it will stick its proboscis out. Uh, in fact, there was a company in Sentinel in, in the UK that had a device where they would strap this bee onto a jacket and put a camera on top so you can actually measure how far the proboscis went out and based on how far it went, it will tell you whether you had TNT in, in the environment. Okay, not very practical in my mind. I know the, I think the company was looking for phase two funding. I don't know whether they did or not, but they were on BBC a while ago. Uh, so we said, let's look at the molecular mechanism that's involved in that process. So if you look at the antenna, the specific molecules called odor binding proteins. That's na the natural function of this protein is to bind to hydrophobic molecules that are secreted by flowers and, and pheromones from other bees that bind to this odor binding protein. It phases it across the hydrophilic environment onto a receptor on a neuron that causes a signal transduction cascade. So what you have is a chemical event or odor, and odor binding event that leads to an action potential or, or electrical signal. And that's how the bee senses uh, the explosive. So we said, let's replace this whole in vivo system with a simple electronic device. We just use FET. We use a carbon nanotube FET device. And we said, let's functionalize that FET device with a receptor-like function that is derived from this odor binding protein. 
Okay. So we did some modeling on trying to understand how the peptides bind to a target like TNT. This was TNT for, for the DARPA program. And then on one end, we put that TNT binding domain. On the other hand, we went to this carbon nanotube binding domain we identified through a phase display route that I showed you earlier. Made a fusion protein, did modeling to make sure it binds. We, we can see the uh, energetics of the binding and making sure that uh, the TNT will still be recognized. We did that all in silico. And then we did the experiment. So here's the experiment showing you the binding of TNT, which is in red. You can see the differences in the current. When there's TNT introduced into the system, you can see a slight rise, a steady rise in, 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 in the current in that FET device. If I put RDX into the same system, it's a flat line. So now the peptide, you have created a receptor-like function onto the carbon nanotube device using this uh, odor binding protein as a way to capture and bring that molecule closer to the carbon nanotube surface and influence its electronic properties. Now, as you know, if I use the bare carbon nanotube, it'll just respond to anything at some level. So there's no specificity to that FET device. What I've created is specificity to that CNT device using that peptide uh, ligand. And we can get, to, get down to about 12 parts per billion in vapor phase. And in liquid phase, we are about, I think, 20 parts per trillion uh, detection limit. Okay? And this is in the presence of other interference. This is not pure TNT vapor that we put in. We just put this with other things in there. I think we put up a five different interference, and we can still detect it. Okay. So that was TNT explosive. Yeah, that's great. Can we now actually hone on to a very specific need uh, for, for the Air Force? Uh, in collaboration with uh, the Human Effectiveness Directorate and the Human Performance Wing, we have been using some of these devices to look at molecular markers that are associated with human performance. Uh, it's been, uh, over the last several years, there have, been, there have been studies showing that there are molecular markers for cognition and vigilance. Uh, they've identified things like neuropeptides, cytokines, dopamine or epinephrine that is involved in stress, uh, that's involved in cognition. Uh, and, and, and other function, neurological functions. So here's one example of a study that was done, I think, in Northwestern, uh, where they took a bunch of kids and threw them, threw them off a plane for skydiving. And they said, let's measure your uh, levels of certain uh, uh, markers in, in, in the plasma and sweat before and after. And what they saw is that before, several hours before they even jumped off the plane, they start to see an increase in some of these molecular markers. So even before you show a physiological process, you see, you begin, you begin to see uh, some of these markers show up. Okay, so you know you can take things like vitals, where you can take BP and, and blood pressure or oxygen or other things, and tell if someone is stressed. But that's pretty much too late. Okay, you want to intervene much earlier than that because that's already there's already a physiological event that's occurred, and you're showing that. So the idea is, can you start taking things like sweat or saliva and actually monitoring some of these markers uh, in individuals uh, that, that show uh, what, uh, markers in this individual to make sure you can, you can know when, uh, when they might be prone to a uh, stressful situation. I like this graph here. This, this bell curve uh, graph shows you that modulation of neuro, neuro, neurological transmitters is, is, is very critical. Okay? There's a sweet spot where you have what we call optimum uh, prefrontal cortex function which is involved in memory, multitasking, and other things. If you have too much of, of this two neurotransmitter, dopamine or neuroepinephrine, uh, you begin to see stress. That also leads to PTSD as well. If it's too low, you begin to see neurogenerative diseases uh, crop in those individuals. So there's a window where you have to maintain the levels of these molecules. Okay? So it'd be nice to be able to cont continuously monitor an individual, non-invasively, some of these markers, uh, to see where they fall in that range. Uh, uh, and some of us, you know, when we get stressed out, some of these levels do go up. So then functions, multitasking functions start to uh, decrease. So you have decrement in, in cognitive uh, ability, uh, but also in vigilance. Uh, so cleanly, clearly you have to sort of moderate the levels of your neurotransmitters. Uh, from, an AFRL system, uh, from an AFRL standpoint, uh, you know, we are working in a, in a, uh, on a program on, on developing uh, with uh, the Human Effectiveness Directorate and also Census Directorate uh, called uh, Human Performance Monitoring. And the idea is that with, with the dependence of autonomous systems uh, and, and, and complex tasks that are accomplished by, by, by machines, now you, what the, the, the thing that's limiting us is, is the human in the loop because there's so much data being thrown at you uh, that you're not able to concentrate, you're going to miss things, uh, there's information overload. So in order to seamlessly integrate that, uh, where you want to integrate uh, the autonomous system, the human, and also that de the de decision-making uh, 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 
uh, quadrant as well, you want to make sure you're able to monitor the human uh, in the loop. Okay, and human performance monitoring is one way. That's not the only thing you do. You have to do training and other things. But you want to give, give enough, uh, you want to get enough information about the individual that's involved in this task uh, to make sure you don't have things like fatigue and stress uh, that are cropping up. And, and this is what RH has been sort of putting together is what they call, not preemptive, they call it sensing, assessing, and augmentation as sort of a roadmap uh, to sort of uh, interfacing the human uh, within uh, that human in the loop uh, kind of systems. So what we did here is we actually took our approach of where we have now something that we use as zinc oxide FET, so we changed it just a little bit, and we looked at a molecule that's called orexin A. Orexin A is a neuropeptide that's involved in cognition impairment, and when orexin A levels start to fall, they begin to see a loss in, uh, in, in cognitive uh, abilities, but also you, you begin to see uh, loss, uh, you begin to see sleep deprivation as well. It is found in blood and saliva, but very high levels in the cerebrospinal fluid. Okay. I'm saying this because there are orders of magnitude differences between what's in saliva and sweat and, the, and cerebrospinal fluid. Now, if you have a device that's not sensitive enough, then you have to do spinal tap every time to, look, to identify some of these molecules, and I'm sure people will not like that. So you want to have something that can detect highly, at very sensitive levels in maybe saliva or sweat uh, some of these markers. And the concept we have that we've been working on in, in AFRL through a 6.2 program is to come up with some kind of a smart bandage uh, that would allow us to, that would enable detection of some of these uh, neurological markers and other molecules of interest uh, that's involved in, in, in cognitive uh, human performance, uh, uh, in human performance, and to be able to do that wireless remotely detect, uh, you know, those, those, those levels of, of some of these markers uh, using an RFID-based kind of device. And, and this is a program that we've been working on and developing uh, in, 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 in AFRO. So what we did is we took the orexin binding peptide that binds to orexin A. And this is just a computational modeling showing the binding peptide and the target. And we put a, a zinc oxide binding peptide on the other end, uh, coded an F, a zinc oxide uh, FET device that was provided to us by the census directorate. Uh, this is just an AFM image showing that a peptide likes to bind to the zinc oxide specifically and not anywhere else. And you can see a very nice, uh, actually we see 10 orders of magnitude uh, response in the device in the presence of this peptide. So it specifically recognizes orexin A. Uh, we can get 10 orders of magnitude uh, dynamic range. And we can even detect it in saliva. We can get down to about 10 femtomolar concentration in saliva. So this is key because you want to be within that range to be able to use it in, in saliva or sweat uh, because if you're in the micromolar or nanomolar regime, it's not going to work. So clearly when you have even 10 femtomolar, you can see a very nice increase in the signal uh, specific to orexin A. And you know, saliva is, is a nasty uh, uh, medium because there are other interfering molecules. So we just spike it with a little bit of orexin A and you can detect it. So, and I just put here physiological levels of, of orexin A in the blood is anywhere between 10 to the 8 to the 20 to the 12th uh, molar uh, concentration. So you have to be sensitive enough to be able to detect that. So what we've achieved is sort of providing onto this device molecular recognition uh, properties that can be used to sense uh, specific markers in, in, in the saliva. And this is just negative control that if I scramble that sequence, it's a flat line, uh, but only if I have that specific peptide sequence that I'll get a response. So it's just not some random binding event. It's highly specific to the recognition element that we put in there. So that is what we've done with peptides, and, and that is not unexpected, because we're trying to explore, exploit the molecular recognition properties of biological molecules and introducing that onto devices. Now here's just a, a, an interesting thing that we've recently begin to notice, is that when I start putting biological molecules, which are chiral in nature, because they have a handedness to them, either right-handed or left-handed, uh, proteins and DNA different, D DNA right-handed, proteins left-handed, and they have a very nice CD structure signal. So when you do cyclo dichroism, they will absorb, uh, I, in, in the cases of peptide, they have negative ellipticity, so you'd always see a nice dip uh, when you do a circular dichroism because they differentially absorb the circular pores right light, and they absorb in the range of 200 to 300 nanometers. Now, if I take a solution of nanoparticles, whether it's quantum dots, silver, or gold, put that into a, into a vial, and you measure it, you pretty much get a flat line because it's achiral. You don't see any signal. But what we saw is that when I take that peptide and I mix it with a gold nanoparticle, now I see this, the signal that comes from the peptide, but now the plasmon uh, band of the gold nanoparticle, that also becomes chiral. 
Okay? So you have seen, you're, you're beginning to artificially create a plasmon CD signature when you combine the two materials together. Okay? We've never seen this, it doesn't happen by itself because that's gold nanoparticles by itself, flat line, and the peptide does not have uh, uh, any peak in the visible uh, regime. It's only when you combine the two, you begin to see that signal. And through some uh, calculations that we have done in collaboration with uh, Shasha Gavarov at Ohio University, uh, it is the interaction between the dipole, which is your peptide, and the gold nanoparticles. You have this, uh, the columbic interaction that gives rise to this, this plasmonic peak. Now, it's highly dependent if I use a uh, rod, so the, the, the peak actually shifts. So you have two modes, and you can actually get those modes also show up okay, within, in, in the CD, in the presence of, of the peptide. But what was interesting is I, I asked Joe Slosik, uh, the, the scientist working on the, on the project, I said, okay, we have left-handed and right-handed uh, peptides. Let's do the experiment. If I use the, if I use the right-handed peptide, will the surface plasma resonance peak also flip? Because if it's just a simple interaction, you should just see a flip of that signal, and the surface plasma should actually be on the positive side too. Okay? Because what I showed you earlier is that when I put that gold nanoparticle, I get the negative peak, which corresponds to the negative peak of the peptide. Uh, so both of them are negative. But what he saw is when I took a right-handed peptide, which has a positive peak, as I mentioned, because it's right-handed, and I put it with my gold particle, I mix it, I get a chiral inversion of the peptide. The peptide actually changes its chirality, okay? which this has never been shown before, uh, that, you, that you would get a chiral inversion of peptides. There are processes in biology, I'll show you in the end, that occurs, but that's in disease states and in a venom uh, using a specific protein because you have to physically break the bonds to get a car inversion. It's just not uh, just a random event. So the question we had is, is this an optical artifact? Are we just seeing an optical artifact, or is this really some chemical rearrangement occurring with the peptide? So the easiest way to do that is just use enzymes. So you can get specific enzymes that can cleave peptides or proteins. So his uh, chymotrypsin that will cleave between tyrosine and phenylalanine. Uh, uh, will cleave a tyrosine and phenylalanine. So we have a tyrosine there, we have phenylalanines, and it'll cleave there if the peptide is left-handed in nature. If it's right-handed, it will not. Okay, so we do thin layer electrophoresis. So a left-handed, this is the intact peptide. You add chymotrypsin, you cleave it, you get the two cleavage products. This is the right-handed version. When I add chymotrypsin, there's no cleavage. The peptide remains intact. So the peptide cannot recognize the D form because it's only specific to the L form. But then the story is different. When I add it onto a gold nanoparticle, I can get cleavage, okay? So the, 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 the intact peptide now is broken to the various fragments. We have done mass spec, all sorts, and MR, all sorts of things. And we can actually pull out the sequences and where the cleavage occurs on that peptide. Okay, so you can map it where exactly the cleavage is. So the question is, you're getting cleavage, of course. You get cleavage of the D peptide when it's bound to the gold nanoparticle. But then the question is, is it the whole peptide has become D or this portion of it that's become D? And that's the next question we ask. We actually use pep proteins that can cleave a variety of different protein SK, for example, will, will cleave a lysine and tyrosine. Endolysine will cleave here. Chymotrypsin will cleave here. Endopro C will cleave at the pro proline. So you can actually step through and map where the inversion takes place. And what we see is that the inversion takes place only in one half of the peptide, not the other half. Okay? And the reason because of this is we've done this uh, through other studies through NMR and other things, is that this part of the peptide actually is away from the surface of the gold nanoparticle. So you don't really get uh, a change or transition from, from a D to L. The ones that's close to the surface of the gold nanoparticle, you actually get the transition. So you have to be in close contact, and there must be some kind of a catalytic effect of the gold nanoparticle on the peptide that actually causes rearrangement of the bond. So chemically, we know it's, it's, it's an inversion because the, pep, the enzyme is seeing it. And we can take other enzymes and throw it with gold nanoparticles or on nonspecific peptides, and we don't see the same thing happen. The, the key is that that peptide has to bind to the gold surface. And now this, this interaction is not through a tile. This is through non coven interactions. If you use a tile linkage to pull it down to the gold nanoparticle, we don't see it. Okay, so we only see it if there's close contact with the gold surface. Okay, so we've been able to map it, uh, and we're still trying to sort of go through all the experiments because every time I talk about it, someone else comes with a new ex set of experiments to try. And before we send it out for review, because I think this will be a really interesting story uh, to put out there, but there are always new experiments uh, to try, so we've been hesitant to put it out uh, as of now uh, until we finish uh, other experiments. So does this tell, would this have any impact on, on some of the things that you see in terms of in biology where you get chiral switching? 
So there are venoms uh, in, in frogs, spiders, uh, in snails that actually go from an L to D transition, but it requires a, an isomerase. So this protein isomerase actually causes bond breaking and flips uh, that, that peptide sequence to take on a D configuration, okay? Uh, under disease states, you also see that in, in cataracts and in other things and in Alzheimer-based diseases, you begin to see the accumulation of D amino acids, okay? And D amino acids is also used to sort of date fossils and other things uh, because the half-life of some of these things are about 3,000 years. So you can sort of age, date uh, some of these materials by looking at the content of D amino acids uh, in, in some of this material. So again, this opens up some interesting uh, applications of the interaction between nanoparticles and, 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 and peptides and how maybe you can use chiral switching uh, to create new functionalities in, in some of these materials. Uh, it doesn't happen in all nanoparticles, so if I took through in a silicon nanoparticle, it doesn't happen. It happens only in gold and silver. So it could be something that's associated with the electronic structure or catalytic activity of some of the structures that drives uh, the, the bond rearrangement on the surface of the gold nanoparticle. And if you even do some simple uh, molecular mechanics program to look at the energy of interactions between a D amino acid peptide and L amino acid peptide, the L amino acid peptide always has a higher affinity, uh, has a stronger interaction compared to the, to the D form. So you always ask the question, why has nature selected the L, for L form and never the D form? It could just be that the stability of some of the structures, energy of interactions uh, are much higher, and maybe that's why we all have L forms, and those are the functional forms. Um, again, brings up a lot of interesting questions. I put a question mark here, is this a new bio metamaterial? I don't know that we have created because you don't see this in, in, in nature. Um, I, I think I'm, I'm running out of time here. Let me quickly talk to you about just uh, in, in, in a couple slides, uh, an interesting sort of a seedling that was, that was provided to us by OSR on trying to look at self-assembled protein cages. And, and I'll just show you just a, a brief glimpse on what we've been able to do. This is very unexpected. This was a crazy idea based on a discussion. I think Hugh and, and myself and, and, and Tom Russell, when he came over for a SAB uh, back in 2009, said, uh, have you guys thought of using some of your protein cages for some of this experiment? So I said, yeah, we can give it a try and see what happens. So this is actually assembling protein cages on the surface of energetic particles and trying to see what happens to the energetics. Do we, do we modify the energetics of nano aluminum? And we've been seeing some very interesting properties arise from that. We also have some work uh, in trying to use peptides to create supermolecular structures so we can create peptide nanotubes. So this is a forest of peptide nanotubes. It looks like carbon nanotubes, but this is completely made out of peptides. So we're using diphenylalanine, so two amino acids, using PECVD uh, approach. This is in collaboration with Tim Bunning, and you can get very nice nanotubes formed. And these things are very strong. I think the mechanical product, the youngest modulus of this is about 10 gigapascals uh, of, of these tubes. And when we do mechanical compression studies, this thing, don't, they don't bend. They actually snap off the surface and fly off uh, when we push down on them. So for an organic molecule, it's, it's pretty tough. Uh, some of them are electrically conductive or semiconducting. Uh, this is a tyrosine tube that we've pinned down and measured the electronic properties of that. Uh, tyrosine, though, because of the pi-pi conjugation, you can get some electron electrical conductance through the tube. So interesting properties there uh, that arise from that. And we also look at you know, creating composite structures. Uh, but enough of that. So let me talk to you about uh, some of the work on protein cages. Uh, just because of time, uh, just showing you that you know, nano aluminum is, is, is the material that we chose to look at uh, because that's used as, as, as a material for uh, combustion and maybe in, in as, a, as a fuel uh, for uh, rocket, as a fuel for uh, in rocket fuel and other uh, propellants. And, and the thing that limits a lot of the, this, this, those, this materials are, are that you have to control the, the combustion kinetics is limited by mass transport of the reactants, the diffusion distance, and, hum and, and uh, inhomogeneous in uh, mixtures. Because what people do is they take nano aluminum, they either throw in an oxidizer, it could be using a, a, a thermite based reaction, so you throw in iron oxide, or you use a, a chemical combustion process using ammonium persulfate, you throw that in. Uh, but what happens is that you, because of poorly defined interfaces and the hum inhomogeneity of the, of the mixture, you don't get effective, or you don't see an increase in, in the combustion kinetics. And they become very stable. You can't just throw in uh, ammonium posulfate and, and nano aluminum. And they're highly reactive. So just walking down the room might set it off. So you have to be very careful. So that's why you want to make sure you reduce diffusion rates. You have somehow been able to capture it or encapsulate it uh, so they only you know, combust when you, when, when you want them uh, to. 
uh, and not just uh, uh, randomly. So one of the things we've been, this is work we've been doing for a while, is looking at protein cages. This are about 12 nanometer sized cages that can be genetically engineered to display on the surface uh, specific chemical moieties. Uh, and it also has a core of about eight nanometers, so you can actually stuff things in there if you want, uh, and then you can deliver it onto the surface. So the crazy idea we had is let's engineer that surface of the, of the ferritin or apoferritin to have uh, chemical ligands on the surface that likes the surface of nanoaluminum. So the aluminum particle has a thin oxide layer, so we, the idea is to sort of bind to that oxide layer through the ferritin cage, and the ferritin is what will deliver the oxidizer to the surface, whether it's iron oxide that is inherent to the ferritin, because we have ferritin, everybody has ferritin, it's just a, a, a way of sequestering iron, uh, excess iron in, in, in the body. Uh, so there's already iron oxide in there. Or you can bring ammonium persulfate and load it in or put it on the outside. So we tried all different kinds of tricks and say, well, how does it behave? So the first experiment, throw in ferritin, which has the iron oxide core, and just do differential thermoanalysis and compare it just to nanoaluminum. The first thing we saw is that we see an increased heat flow uh, uh, with the biothermite complex, so it's ferritin with the nanoaluminum mixed together, and this is just the nanoaluminum by itself. This is the melting that you see from the nanoaluminum, and you can see that the peak is, this is equal amount, so the peak is sort of reduced here because you get combustion much earlier, and this is where the ferritin completely sort of uh, disappears or, or dissolves, so the melting of, the, of, of, of it occurs. Now, if you add ammonium persulfate, you actually see a, a massive increase in the heat flow, and you can see the, the, the aluminum is completely used up even before that 650 degrees point is reached, okay? Because you bring both just the, you have the thermite reaction, but also you bring in the, the oxidized ammonium persulfate, which you also can load onto the surface of the ferritin cages. And the reaction is, com is, is, is entirely exothermic. You can see that huge burst uh, in, in the heat flow as you do the reaction. This is just a TM micrograph showing the aluminum nanoparticles, and you can see this thing's a, the ferritin is small, uh, this is unstained, so the, the, the electron-dense uh, dots that you see there is actually the iron oxide from the ferritin that actually decorates the surface. Uh, we have done EDS mapping to show things, but, but the thing is we've been able to show that you can not create one layer, you can actually use rational design to sort of create multiple layers, so you can build in you can put ferritin, you can put ammonium persulfate, you can put ferritin, you can actually build the layers very nicely. You can go from two to four layers. Uh, this is just showing the mapping, and this is showing QCM, showing that the mass increases with every layer we put onto that surface. We've done zeta potential measurements, and you can see the, the, by differential thermoanalysis that the, the, the exothermic reactions actually start to creep up as you increase the layer. And you can see new peaks, uh, exothermic peak uh, that occurs uh, for some of those reactions. So you're actually seeing uh, an increase in, in, in the combustion kinetics when you mix these things together. This is combining just bulk thermite. This is 50% by weight uh, iron oxide uh, with, uh, with nanoaluminum. And you can see this is the reaction kinetics, and this is our four-layer ferritin-based kinetics. You can see a huge difference uh, in, 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 in the reaction kinetics. The question is, is this practical? Because uh, this is a bio-based approach, and we're using ferritin. Uh, maybe not. But what you can get is design of, you know, where we're using this layer by layer assembly concept. Maybe you can use this design create, to create highly effective uh, uh, energetic materials uh, using the ferritin based approach. You don't have to use biology all the time, biology can help inspire. This is just a crazy idea. Uh, when, when, when Mike and I were talking about this, he was saying, okay, what would you do with this? I said, I really don't know. Uh, this is not my area, this, but this is something that maybe can be used. In the design, if someone's interested, is looking at some of these approaches to design uh, newer materials. Uh, and this was going to be my last area, but I think I'm going to stop because I think I've bored you enough with some of, with some of the work that's going on. But since Joycelyn is here, I will end with maybe one or two slides, if you would, would bear with me. This, let me uh, talk about this slide because this is exciting to me. This is actually a transition of a basic research program. Uh, to addressing a, a need for DITRA, to come up with a paper-based uh, microfluidic sensor for toxic agents. So they were interested in developing a paper-based diagnostic device that can detect nerve agents. So this is combining uh, enzyme kinetics with biopolymers like silk uh, onto paper, creating enzymatic reactions on paper and showing that I can use a simple portable device like a cell phone or a, a, a flatbed scanner to scan a paper uh, that shows you know, a collimatic response in the presence of a nerve agent, and then I can sort of use the mean intensity using simple algorithms or apps that I can build into the phone, and I can tell you what is the concentration of the target agent 
in, in the environment. Okay, so just give me a minute. Let me just walk through, walk through this experiment. So we use silk fibroin, which is a, uh, so a biopolymer that comes from silkworm. We have shown with David Kaplan that if you put enzymes in there, they're highly stable. They're stable against UV, detergent, and temperature. Uh, some of the work that George Whiteside has been doing on trying to build some paper-based diagnostics, he always keeps those two reagents separate. So he just does the diagnostics at the time of the assay. So the diagnostics is, or the, the reagents are kept in a fridge or stored separately. And then what he does, he combines the two when he wants to do the experiment. Okay? So clearly you still have to do refrigeration. You have to preserve the biomolecule. What we showed is you can use the silk fibroin to actually coat paper. So this is just fluorescent imaging showing that the, the cellulose fibers can be coated with silk fibroin, and I can throw in an enzyme as well. Uh, so they will, it'll encapsulate the enzyme, and it'll immobilize it onto the paper. Uh, and then if I add OPA, OP, which is organophosphate, so organophosphate hydrolase is the enzyme, uh, is the enzyme that's used for detecting uh, nerve agents and also for decon. Uh, what happens in the presence of organophosphate, it turns yellow. Okay. So you can sort of use a, a flatbed scanner if you want, or even a cell phone, take an image, and you can sort of measure the p intensity of the, of the yellow color, and you can back calculate what is the concentration of OPH in, in the environment. And we've been able to show that you can you get very nice detection capabilities after about 25 micromoles, and the, the, the enzyme that's immobilized onto the paper is much more stable than the free enzyme. And if you really want to do some testing, we put this in, in brackish salt water from the aquarium that we have, did the assay under that, we washed it so many times in that solution, and you can still retain the activity. You can put it in heat, SDS, uh, it doesn't seem to kill it. The activity is reduced, but you can still get a positive signal from it. And you can have that at room temperature for about 28 days, and it still works. Okay, so this is a very nice, I think in my mind, a transition of a 6-1 program on trying to understand structure proper relationships of silk, encapsulating enzymes, and actually developing a simple device, a paper-based device uh, for that. And, and, and some work that we're beginning to look at is look at Heracli biopolymer composites. Uh, this is from a jaw from a marine worm. Uh, this is a highly skeletalized tissue that is composed of a protein that, is, that contains histidine residues that's involved in, that's, it's an imidazole, imidazole containing amino acid that cross-links or binds to metal ions. And that's what causes an increase in the hardness of the material. And the, the, the worm uses this jaw to actually catch its prey and tear it apart. So it's actually very strong. Uh, I don't have the Ashby plot here, it's on, in my initial slide. I think the, the, the modulus on that is about maybe 15 gigapascals on that jaw uh, that's been done. But what they see is that it's a gradient composite. They have copper only at the, at the tips of that, not the whole way across that, uh, that structure. It also looks at hidden length concepts and porosity as a way that combines it to create uh, this highly mechanically strong uh, material. Uh, what we've been doing is taking, trying to identify, not identify the protein. The, identi the protein was identified by Galen Stuckey and Herb White. What we've been expressing it in E. coli, so we can express the jaw protein in E. coli. This is a, a glob of it that's dried down, very fibrous. Uh, and we can build composites. And what we begin to see is very interesting properties. This thing super contract. So I can put it in a specific solution, either pH or salt. This thing will contract. If I put it back into water, it'll expand. So I can go back and forth. It's a simple, uh, you know, uh, muscle-like structure that goes under contraction and, and swelling in, in very specific uh, conditions uh, in the presence of either pH salts or, or, or divalent metal cations. Uh, the idea is we're trying to sort of decouple some of these various elements to see how does that all lead to increased mechanical properties uh, and, and understanding uh, what is it so special about this protein. Uh, is it you just want the imidazoles? Can I just take any polymer with imidazoles in there, throw ions in there, cross-link it, and see what happens? Will I be able to recapitulate some of those mechanical properties? And this is some of the things that we're, we're interested in, in sort of pursuing in the next uh, couple of years. Uh, this is my summary slide. Uh, what I've shown is biological materials and processes can be used in the synthesis and direct assembly of materials across multiple land scales that can be used for DOD applications. Uh, providing fundamental understanding of biological systems, opportunities as well as limitations. I tell you some of the successes, there are a lot of failures too, uh, we've, that we've, we've seen through the process, that this, some of these materials cannot be used for, and so that helps us sort of narrow down And when we look at 6-2 programs. And, and I'm grateful for the opportunity from, from OSR because this has provided a solution for some of our 6-2 programs when it comes to our STT and roadmaps. Uh, it's, it's, it's the fundamental knowledge that's, that's been gained uh, through the research activities actually helped us secure 6-2 funding. 
Uh, and we are hoping that by getting some of the 6.2 uh, activities going and sort of uncovering some additional questions to be asked, we can feed that back to you guys. And maybe you guys would be interested in you know, investing $6.1 uh, to, to sort of help us in, in, in transitioning some of these processes uh, in a 6.2 program uh, with, with partnership with industrial guys as well as other scientists at AFRL. With that, I thank you for your attention. I know it was a little long, but I think this is an opportunity to sort of highlight uh, some of the work that's going on in AFRL. And again, I'm highly grateful for the opportunity that you guys have given us uh, in, in funding some of the work at AFRL. Thank you. Tell, tell that to Hugh. Make sure he has that. <laughs> I'm wondering about, so in order to do that, the peptide's got to probably sit on the gold nanoparticle. Right. So what's the binding force? What's driving the binding of their there's no slide? No, so then well, if you see the amino acid sequ sequences, there's no tiles in it. So there's not through a, a tile linkage. The, the interactions are not covalent. They interact. It's through hydroxyl-containing groups as well as other aromatic groups that we have, through modeling and experiment, experimental work, that we've been able to pinpoint some of the residues that are involved in that interaction. And it's a multivalent interaction. It's just not one amino acid. It's multiple amino acids that are involved in interaction. So we're trying to tease apart using both experimental and modeling tools. Uh, but we know that, that the interaction has to be tight. If we make mutations and it's closed and it starts flopping around, you don't see that change. So it has to be in close contact with, with the gold nanoparticle surface. That's all I can say at this point. Uh, we don't have other data to support uh, what exactly is happening. Whether it's at the edges of the particles, or where it's catalytically active, is that where that's happening? Uh, we also see even on planar surfaces, we see a little bit of chiral switching as well. But planar surfaces on a QCM crystal, which are still islands of gold, it's not a, a, a nice gold film, so. Uh, well, Mm -hmm. so, so one of the things we were, we were trying to identify, why is the L form of amino acids, so the L form is the functional form of proteins, right? And, and we were just trying to understand from a peptide uh, point of view, why is it that, you know, we see the inversion? Is there something different in the interaction energies between an L and a D form on a gold nanoparticle surface? Initially, we said there should be no difference because the chemical moieties, functional groups are still the same. They're just displayed in a different chirality, so there should be no difference in the interaction. But when we did some modeling experiments, it showed that there's difference in the interaction energies. So I wonder whether that is what, in the primordial soup, if you would like, maybe that's what drove things to become L versus D, is that interaction with some inorganic surface, whether it's sand or, or silicon in, in the primordial soup that caused it to call you know, L amino acids to evolve and not D. It's a hypothesis. It's a crazy one. I'm sure if we put that out, the origin of life of people will jump all on, on us. And, but it's just a hypothesis we have, so. Hey, um, I really enjoyed it and fascinating. So, so um, if I'm just getting correct, uh, so if you want to have certain nano coding or molecule have certain molecules or whatever that electrical photo properties, there's still a try and error and then you have to try different combinations to see if that works. And uh, so that's why sometimes it works. But quite often most of the time it didn't work. So is there any way of systematically and in this case it's mass based of Right. So one of the things we've been doing, just as, as a simple experiment, going back to sort of the abiotic biotic interaction, just as a simple, uh, let me put this up here. As just as, let's just frame it around that, okay? So we take a cometer approach, right? And then we screen through this takes weeks to identify peptides that like to bind to a surface, okay? We find the sequences. In some cases, you know, I have to screen about maybe 100 clones, and then I have maybe one or two that work, and the rest don't, the rest are junk. 
So the idea is if we're able to use a combination of experimental but also computational and mathematical tools to drive how we can reach some of the sequences, that's what we're looking for. We're beginning to do that. Uh, it, it's harder with sort of the inorganic targets because, you know, when I buy nanoparticles, I buy one nanoparticle today and I buy it tomorrow, they're completely different, okay? The companies also don't tell you what's on there. And even if you synthesize it in the lab where you control everything, even small contaminants in your water or your buffer changes the nanoparticle surface. It becomes really hard. But what we're beginning to look is looking at protein-protein interactions. So, you know, like the orexin A peptide I showed you that binds to orexin A. We know the structure of that protein. Crystal structure is known. That structure does not change. We can actually look at it under CD. So we know if things change, we can sort of monitor that. Now, if I know a peptide likes to bind to orexin A, can I use that as a starting point to sort of drive the computational tool? So I have one sequence. That might not be the optimum sequence. It just happens to be what I pulled out. Can I use rational design? And that's what we're beginning to do. Then I can create a, a peptide chip. So the computational guy will give me 100 sequences and say, hey, test this. I can put that onto a chip and do a quick one experiment, one test, pull out what is the optimum sequence that, through that approach. So we're beginning to that, do that in collaboration with the Human Effectiveness Directorate. Yeah, good point. Thank you. Yes, yes, yeah. Um, it's slow, the, the minutes, they're not, they're not in seconds because, you know, it's diffusion limited. Uh, so it's, it's going to be uh, several minutes for that to occur, okay? And you, you have to remember, this is in bulk. We're doing it. We're just, we're just cutting it onto, you know, by hand and or casting into a PDMS sheet, a PDMS mold, excuse me, uh, and then doing it. So this is the protein by itself. Yeah, you can see the nice contraction. This is a contraction. This is when we put silk and NVJP1. We can actually cause this to contract. The silk does not con contract. Uh, it only super contracts when it's dry. It goes the other way. So it's a little bit different behavior uh, than NVJP1, which is uh, obvious. You dry something, it'll shrink. Uh, in this case, NVJP1 does not shrink. It only shrinks when you put it in a, in a, in a solvent or an aqueous solution. So again, we don't exactly know the processes. We're trying to understand that. Uh, but you know, we know that it has to do something with those histine residues and the way it cross-links with some of the divalent cations or how you change because histine has three pKa's. So you know, if you go through the various pH transition, you're sort of changing that, the, the folding abilities of, or the cross-linking ability of, of histidine. Uh, it's, it's a very interesting polymer. I think almost 50 or 60% is just histidine rich. Okay, very unusual. Uh, we like unusual things. Uh, this is one of the other ones we work on. Uh, I have an online question. Okay. Okay, the, the advantage of having paper-based microfluidics is one, uh, you know, I don't need a PhD level technician to read the results for me. Uh, I can do this on the field. It's cheap, it's low cost. And even if, from a warfighter standpoint, even if it gives me a 50% solution, I mean, if it costs only two cents, I'll take that. Uh, and I think that's sort of what the driver is in terms of using a paper-based diagnostic. And actually, there's some really interesting work that's coming out of Georgia Tech where they're now building electronic circuits directly on paper. So you can, you can, you can you know, build electronic devices, and you can take say, some of these crazy ideas of origami where you can actually fold it. So you can make a device and actually fold it and create 3D devices uh, using a combination of both electronics as well as, as origami on a, on a flexible device. Yes, it's not going to be stable if it rains too heavily. Yeah, you know, you, you, you're out of luck. But there are approaches if you want to do, you know, remote sensing, closing ISR sensors. I think those are those are where there's a sweet spot for that. Other questions? Yeah, I have one. Uh, on the graphing that you, you brought up at the beginning, uh, you said you were on the on the graphing that you brought up at the beginning. You said you were comparing. Uh, Carbon nanotubes, yeah. And uh, of course, there's different carbon nanotubes, so they. Single wall. Have, yeah, right. So. Different single wall carbon nanotubes. Yeah. So, uh, therefore, you have the peptide binding. That's right. That's right. And so, have you found that the binding to the graphite actually matches what you would have expected in the, uh, in the carbon nanotubes? 
No. Just ones that are similar no. In fact, this, this, it's very different. So let me go back. Uh, bear with me for a minute. This is a carbon nanotube binding peptide. Okay. So what I've shown here is aromatic residues, and I've shown you the polar residues in black. So you can see very distinct blocks. But it has this one domain is hydrophobic. Okay. And that's how it interacts with the carbon nanotube surface. Now, if I go to the graphene-based peptide, this is hydrophilic, this is hydrophobic, this is hydrophobic, this is hydrophilic, hydrophobic, hydrophilic charged, hydrophilic. Okay? Very different arrangement. When I make this mutation, I am creating this end to be hydrophobic. We did not, we did not, uh, we did not think this was what's happening. I didn't mention, but this now becomes hydrophobic. And you can see that the architecture is completely different. It actually looks more similar to how the carbon nanotube a binder is, uh, or the other binder, because you have more of a planar surface. Okay, so it is where you have distinct domains of hydrophobic, hydrophilic amino acid that drives the interaction. Now, we also know within graphene, you, we can get different kinds. We can get a single layer, we can get four layers. We have done the experiments with single layer graphene, with four layer graphene, we've done graphite, we've done graphite, gra graphite oxide. In all cases, we pull different peptides, but we also pull in things that are common. Uh, so we have a, a set of sequences that would bind to all, and a set of sequences that only bind to one or the other. So again, teasing out what are those structural, uh, the chemical functionalities in those peptides that can discriminate that is, again, where you know, it would be nice to have computational approaches to help us with that or other mathematical models that can help us understand that instead of me having to screen you know, a huge, uh, you know, have you know, four or five undergraduates slaving in the lab uh, doing this and sequencing hundreds and hundreds of clones it's very costly, too, as well. So we try to stop maybe at about 50 clones or so because it gets very expensive sequencing all of them you know, by hand in the lab because you have to pick individual one, each one. So, yeah, so there are differences. So before, before we thank our speaker one last time, I have a little presentation here that I'd like to make. Rajesh, thank you very much. Thank you. And, uh, this is a, uh, our 60th anniversary coin for FOSR, and uh, it's, uh, there's a limited uh, minting. So limited it's, edition. Uh, so it's, uh, it's going to be rare someday. OK. So now, I, I can put it on eBay. Yeah, that's, <laughs> yeah, that's right. That, you get your, your retirement is settled. OK, thank you. <laughs> Appreciate so, it. So now let's thank our speaker one last time.